Good morning, fellow mathematicians. Welcome back to another video. It's finally time. It's finally here. Almost impossible. Integrals, sums, and series by a very nice person. Okay, Colonel Ivan Valian. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I probably mispronounced it. Never mind. We are going to go through the integrals in this book right here, okay? And I'm not certain if I'm going to go through all the integrals in there. Maybe I'm just going to pick out the best ones, okay? And most of those integrals are kind of heavy when it comes to calculating the end results algebraically and whatsoever. So for the most part I'm going to skip this, okay? Because I want to encourage you guys to actually go ahead and buy his book. I'm not going to make any money from it, okay? He sent me this book right here. I wouldn't say it's sponsored, he's just such a nice person and I thank you Cornell for sending me this masterpiece right here. It's so much fun going through all those integrals, sums and series, which are almost impossible. <laughs> so um, I thank you for this. You can find the links to Springer Amazon whatsoever down there in the description. Go and support the creator. Don't rip off those PDFs somewhere online, okay? Go ahead, buy this book right here. It's seriously a good one, okay? And we're going to start off with the first one in the book. It's a nice trigonometric integral and yeah, I'm going to see you in a second. We're going to dive right in and there's also going to be some kind of outtake video and or other video then coming those next few days because those less calculations, like I said, are kind of heavy, okay? Some, some heavy calculations in there and for the most part I'm going to skip those, okay? But, but this time I'm going to go through those in a different video. Okay, give me a second, I'll be right back. <laughs> So we are going to go ahead and get started. This right here was a sponge and I kicked it away like an absolute mad lad. One very cool thing about Corner's book is that he's providing you guys with challenge problems, okay? For example, in this integral right here, you might notice that we have a y right here, meaning this thing is parameterized. If the y wouldn't be there, it would be way easier to solve. But with this y right here, we are going to end up with something really nice, a little identity and with those identities in the books, he's actually challenging the reader, left as an exercise to the reader, to, for example, transform this thing right here into the basal problem, okay? Make use of this newly acquired identity to get the basal problem pi squared over six out of this whole ordeal. So this is really good. But I'm not going to present the challenge problems to you guys because I want to encourage the viewer to actually go ahead and buy his book to support the creator of this very nice book. It's so warm in here, 34 degrees Celsius. I'm sweating like a filthy pig. Now, like I said, this thing is parameterized, making it a bit harder to solve. And there are many ways to actually solve this thing right here. For example, um, well, we have the square root of one minus something squared. It just comes in really natural to introduce um, for example, trigonometric or hyperbolic substitution right here. Hyperbolic substitution, for example, the hyperbolic tangent would work, if I'm not mistaken, or we have the cosine and the sine working out because we have the fundamental theorem of trigonometry. I'm giving each and every integral in this book a shot, okay? I'm, I'm going to try to solve it on my own. If I come up with a way on my own, that's nice. I'm going to present it to you guys. Other than that, I'm just going to go by the book, proofs by the book right here. And on this one, I'm going to go by his way because when I first did it, I introduced the wrong substitutions two times and it didn't go anywhere. But if I just make a simple change of variable, so if we say that x is nothing but the sine, of t, okay, it does make sense to use this right here, it does make perfect sense, you're going to see this in the middle. Then we also know that dx is nothing but, well, the cosine of t dt. If we plug all of this into here, what are we going to get in the first place? An integral of, okay, when is the sine equal to zero? Well, at zero in the principal branch. And when is it going to be one? Well, at pi over two in this case, okay? So pi over two, and then the x is nothing but the cosine of t. Then we have a dt right here over one plus, this is x times y, so the sine of t times y times the square root of, 
like I said, fundamental theorem of trigonometry. That's why we are using um, hyperbolic or trigonometric functions. We're going to have the square root of 1 minus sine squared. This is the square root of cosine squared, leaving us with the absolute value of the cosine of t. No matter which hyperbolic or trigonometric substitution you introduce, those are going to cancel out. Why are they going to cancel out? Well, on this interval from 0 to pi over 2, our cosine is actually strictly positive. So the absolute value is nothing but the thing itself, meaning this is going to cancel out overall. This is not part of the integral, as you might have guessed. And what are we going to be left with? An integral from 0 to pi over 2, dt over 1 plus the sine of t times y. Now, there's one really useful substitution that you can introduce. Maybe you might have already guessed the Weierstrass substitution because this right here is kind of hard to solve, to be honest. This right here is nothing too elementary. You, you are not going to see at a glance what this is going to evaluate to. But if you play around a bit and you introduce something wonderful, namely, for example, that um, z be equal to the tangent, of t over 2, then it's going to work out oneness. I made a video on that already, deriving all the um, important parts of the Weierstrass substitution. Why in the hell is this thing right here so extremely useful in this case? Well, we can turn something trigonometric into something algebraic. That's the point of introducing this thing right here. Because, take a look at that, it's absolutely wonderful to be honest. If we differentiate that, dz is going to become the secant squared of t over 2 times one half, that's the inner derivative, times dt. But even cooler than all of that, just as a little train of thought right here, we can take our fundamental theorem of trigonometry and actually divide both sides by the sine squared to end up with a variant, namely that one is nothing but the secant squared of t, for example, minus the tangent squared of t. Meaning we can actually express our secant squared right here as nothing but z in this case because, take a look, z squared is nothing but the tangent squared of t over 2, but like I said, 1 is equal to secant minus tangent, meaning um, secant squared in this case, or tangent squared, is going to be nothing but, um, okay, what's the tangent squared? I'm terribly sorry, this is going to be secant squared minus 1, okay? So, um, tangent squared is nothing but secant squared of t over 2 minus 1. It really doesn't quite matter which approach you take right here. You're going to be uh, left with the very same thing. So, meaning our secant squared of t over 2 is nothing but z squared plus 1. Just as a little thing, okay? We are going to use this probably in a second. If we don't, then I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> so. One thing that might seem kind of curious is um, how does this right here, this t over 2 substitution, this half angle substitution, help in here because, well, um, sine of t, that's not t over 2, it's not too good. But here comes the reason in why we introduce the sine instead of the cosine right here. Okay, if you introduce the cosine, then you could make use of the double angle formula for the cosine, but that's an absolute mess. This is something that doesn't work out nicely. Okay, but if we introduce the sine right here, oh, I tell you this, it's, it's so wonderful. Because if we have the sine of two times t, this is going to be nothing but two times the cosine of t times sine of t. You see, the double angle formula for the sine is actually pretty nicely. It's just simply defined as the multipl multiplication of things, not the addition or subtraction of things. Now, if we let um, our t in here be equal to t over 2, we are going to get the sine of t, okay, with this as our double angle formula. Let me rewrite this a little bit. We are going to end up with the integral from 0 to pi over 2 dt. Over. I'm going to introduce this substitution in a second. Give me a second. 1 plus 2 times y. And then we are going to have the cosine of t over 2 times the sine of t over 2. This looks better. We are now having 
half angles right here. And now let me introduce all of this. We said that our um, dt is going to be um, 1 over uh, 2 times 1 over secant squared times dz. Okay, let me put this in. That's nothing but 0 to pi over 2 of, okay, we are going to have the cosine squared, so secant is nothing but 1 over cosine, meaning we are going to get the 2 in front. We are going to have the cosine squared of t over 2, and then we are going to have our um, dz right here over. I'm going to turn everything into a set in a second, okay? Just some elementary operations on here. 1 plus 2 times y cosine t over 2 sine of t over 2. And now, one wonderful thing we can actually do is to factor out our cosine squared in the numerator and denominator. Meaning, cosine squared and cosine squared, after factoring them out, are going to cancel out in the process. Meaning, oh, and after the substitution, our upper and lower bounds are going to change respectively. Meaning, if we have the tension of zero, this is going to give us zero overall. So this is good. And if we plug in pi over two, that's the tension of pi over four. That's exactly the point where our sine and cosine meet. So that's one, okay? So sine is equal to cosine, meaning um, tension is sine over cosine. So that's just one. I hope this does make sense to you, okay? So here it already changed somehow after doing the substitution. Now, we are going to have dz over factoring out the cosine squared. And here is going to give us one over cosine squared of t over two. And then we are going to have plus two times y, cosine to the outside, and then one more, giving us sine over cosine is nothing but tangent of t over two. Now, here comes my reasoning in that we had before. One over cosine squared is nothing but the secant squared, meaning this is nothing but z squared plus one. We're going to have dz over z squared plus one, that's the first one, plus two times y times z. Whew, that was already quite a lot of work, okay? But the really cool thing right now is that we actually have a polynomial down here. And why am I still having to pi over two? It's to one, I'm terribly sorry. Having a polynomial down here is really cool because we can actually factor this polynomial in some way using, for example, um, completing the square. I really don't care. <laughs> this thing actually rhymed. And then we can use partial fractions or substitution whatsoever. So why not rearrange this a little bit and let's see how we can actually factor that. So let us take a look at z squared plus two times y times z plus one. How can we factor this? Well. All that's really missing, if we have a plus b squared, that's going to be a squared plus two times a times b plus b squared. So what's really missing is the b squared, meaning in this case y squared, but we also have to subtract, subtract it. Okay, you can add a zero. If you don't place another apple to an apple, you still have the one apple you had before. So plus one in this case. <laughs> so this thing right here is actually nothing but, okay, we are going to have z plus y but squared plus one minus y squared. This thing right here is our new denominator and it works out wonders because for example, if we now let um, whatever variable do we have, eta for example, eta is nothing but z plus y. If we differentiate that, y is just a constant, meaning d eta is nothing but dz. This is really good. We are going to end up with our integral being nothing but, let me see, two times the integral from. If we plug zero into here, so here, this is going to give us just um, y as the lower bound. And if we plug a one into here, this is one plus y. Ooh, it's really warm in here, oh goodness. Um, I'm already out of breath so hard. Then this thing right here is our denominator. dz is now nothing but d eta over, then we are going to have eta squared plus one minus y squared. And now we are basically done. Okay, this is really good. Now we are going to use something that we have used extensively on this channel before. Okay, so if we put this thing right here into square root and square root once again, it's going to be the same thing. 
but extremely important at this point is that we can actually use this thing right here as being nothing but the inverse tangent. We're going to end up with two times one over this argument square root one minus y squared. Okay, just this thing right here. Just ignore this squared and put it down here. Link will be in the description to the corresponding identity. And then the inverse tangent of what are we going to get? So we are going to get eta over square root one minus y squared from y to one plus y. And like I said, I'm going to go through those heavy calculations in a different video. You can find the link then in the description down there. This thing right here is actually a well-known trigonometric identity, probably. It's going to evaluate to the inverse cosine, so arcos cosine, of, in this case, um, y over 2. This might seem extremely random, but I'm going to go through those calculations. They are extremely heavy, if I can say so myself, okay? 2 and 1 over 2 is going to cancel out, with this being our newly acquired identity. I won't leave some fun to you guys, that's why you can go ahead and buy the book, okay? <laughs> and see if you can solve this for example for yourself, this very identity right here. This is what we have right here and you can place restrictions on that. So the absolute value of y should be uh, less than 1 in this case, so we need this to diverge. Um, and also our inverse cosine is only defined on negative 1 to 1, okay? But yeah, this was the first episode of Almost Impossible in Tech Adults. I hope you did enjoy this. It's really warm in here, I just wanna call it quits for today, okay? Woo! I hope this video was okay. Please go ahead and support the creator of this book. He's a very nice guy. He's such a nice human individual. Please support him. He's so cool. <laughs> and he's doing a lot of cool stuff. Add him on Facebook and you can all, um, always see a lot of cool challenging problems. Other than that, I thank you guys for watching. If you did enjoy this video, please like, subscribe, and recommend the channel if you like. If you want to support the channel, buy those t-shirts I created whatsoever. And don't forget to share those videos everywhere. Ciao. <laughs>